Hello, everybody. Good to see you all tonight. Glad you could join us. Um, and I'm really glad to uh, see folks online as well. We're excited to have people joining us also live via Zoom. So if you are joining us via Zoom um, and you would like to ask questions, uh, please wiggle your mouse if you're on a desktop or a laptop. And at the bottom of your screen, you should see a uh, Q&A button. And you can click on that and type a question into the box there. Um, for folks who are joining us in person, and I'm sorry, so you can type a question there. And my awesome colleague, Andrea, is helping to monitor the chat and help out with the chat tonight. And so um, she will let us know when there are questions in the Q&A box. Um, if you are here in person, I invite you to turn off anything that buzz or rings or makes noise. Um, Enjoy our time together. <laughs> um, my name is Julie Chevalier, and I'm the Director of Public Engagement here at the Fisher Art Museum. And I'm really excited to be joined by Joe Padilla for a collector's talk. Um, I'm going to introduce Joe in a second, but he's got the computer, so if you could advance the, the slide one. Just want to make sure that we take a moment to thank some of our supporters. Um, specifically Art Bridges and Philadelphia Museum of Art. So Daring Design, the Impact of Three Women on Morton Mesher's Craft is one in a series of American art exhibitions created through a multi-year, multi-institutional partnership formed by the Philadelphia Museum of Art as part of the Art Bridges Initiative. So we have some key loans from the PMA in the exhibition, and the exhibition is also generously supported by the Bucks County that out of the way, it is my great pleasure to be joined by Joe Padilla tonight. Um, Joe, as I'm sure everybody knows, is the chef and owner of Pizzeria Padilla, which was probably a big blessing and curse, named Best Pizza in America by Bon Appetit Magazine in 2015. Um, Joe is also the author of Pizza Camp, Recipes from Pizzeria Padilla from 2017. Um, and he is also a collector and lover of Wharton Eshrick. And so this is a great chance for us to hear perspectives of someone who is creative in one area, in cuisine, um, and, and explore creativity in, and passion for art forms in other areas like furniture and like design. Um, so this is really an opportunity to just kind of from the curators of the show, this is a chance to get a little bit personal, right, and understand what human connections to our work, which is why I like working with museums. So um, based on our conversations, too, we thought it would be uh, pretty conversational. So if folks have questions throughout, you can raise your hand, let us know, we'll engage you, and Andrea can also help us out and let us know if anybody online has questions. So I'm going to stop talking and turn things over to Joe. You don't help me welcome Joe. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess a couple of things. I, I have a just want to start off by saying that I have a very small collection of Orchestric uh, pieces, but uh, nonetheless, um, stuff that I, I'm really um, happy to uh, kind of I, be, a, be the steward of. Um, and I feel like I've came into collecting um, uh, through my uncle, uh, Bob Hamilton, who's here. Um, mainly just kind of growing up around things, seeing them, and getting a general appreciation um, uh, for sculpture and art and, um, you know, uh, lots of wood and stuff. Um, and I've kind of collected. Uh, collected also creatively and how I've been able to acquire things like, for instance, um, one of the pieces, uh, this sculpture uh, called Nocturne, um, which were actually almost 100 years old right now, which is kind of cool, um, created in 1927. It was available at auction and nobody bid on it. This is the signature from that, which is an interesting uh, 
can see it both as a W and then as an E. Um, it was uh, exhibited in, in 1968 at PAFL, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, and I don't know, just put, this is a, a picture of Wharton with another sculpture. Um, I'm just going to go through some of these. And uh, this is kitchen. Tell us about that. Is that at the Escher House? Yeah, this is at the Escher House. Um, I, I spoke to a friend of mine yesterday, um, Michael Hurwitz, who's kind of like a master woodworker. I don't know if you call him a master. I would probably call him a master. And um, I was just asking him what his thoughts were um because i know from a young person in high school he first experienced eschrick's work and um he said something that resonated with me which i also find in common with uh with wharton is that when he saw this work it was somebody who was doing something so differently um that almost gave him the permission to do whatever he wanted in the way that he thought was impossible. And I feel like I feel the same thing where I've seen other people do work or great work and in, within restaurant um, and uh, specifically when I uh, was in Jap Japan for a while, um, you know, like see people doing things in a way that are unconventional and so different and it's, it's just, um, it's helped me, I guess, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, see what's possible. See what's possible when you feel like you don't fit in, in, in a lot of different ways too, so. Um, this is my friend, Becky Suss. She painted uh, a bunch of um, pieces uh, for Wharton's house. It's a bedroom. She's a, a painter we saw in Philadelphia. They have some pieces in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, and this is at the Fleischer Olin Gallery. Another creative person I know who is also like you know affected by, by his work. Um, and yeah. Can you maybe tell us how you got into pizza and then how you got into Escher? Well, <laughs> so I guess, yeah, and, and I guess as a creative person, you know, I don't know what you want to call, I would call myself like an artist or whatever, but I, I always do some stuff in my own font. So I kind of use that for the, um, for my restaurant here. It's a pizzeria video serving whole pies on our front door. Um, when I, when we created the restaurant, I was um, fortunate enough to have partners that let me have full creative control. Um, there's definitely a lot of um, influence by, you know, by Wharton, maybe even Nakashima and some shaker stuff here. Um, this is one of our dining rooms. I got, um, my, I had my friend uh, Zach, uh, build these two beautiful walnut tables, um, but uh, just being able to kind of create in my own vision, I think was was really important to me um, in creating this new space. Um, that to me is the thing. Yeah, like you're not just creating food; you're creating space too, and all the furniture yeah. plays into that too. So, what were you thinking about with like two large tables? And did the wood matter and things like that? Yeah, I think the wood definitely mattered. I mean, for me, the idea of having something of a certain quality that's going to last um, with a restaurant mm -hmm. environment, you know, with kids and the whole the whole gamut of uh, just misuse. And that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was definitely a, a big part of it, and and just you know, um, kind of clean lines and I don't know, some sort of like urban 
I don't even know how you describe a Japanese farmhouse or something like that's that. Pretty I was just, I'm hearing from our Zoom participants, if you could speak, um, both of you more directly into the mic. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> How long? Oh, that's a good question. I think they're about 12 feet. And the, 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 um, the maker's name is Zach DeLuca. He's in a Philadelphia woodworker. Um, he's great. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the the floors are concrete, um, also concrete block as the walls, so it's like, yeah. And for our folks online, the comment was that the wood softens the space, and, and Joe's just saying, yeah, there's this contrast between the wood and the concrete. There's a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Um, here are people. All of us who did not. Uh, yeah, sorry. Their dance. That's all right. That's all right. It's <laughs> guaranteeing customers later on. <laughs> this is just another piece I'm inspired by um, in the uh, Philadelphia Art Museum. One of Eshrick's uh, kind of masterpiece of a fireplace here. Um, really just beautiful and organic and um, all these lines and everything. And this is the doorway to the same home. One of the things that we see in the exhibition, and you know, that I'm seeing here too, is like you just mentioned clean lines. And Asterix is, is I think, well, what I've come to understand is that what most people are familiar with is maybe some more of his curvilinear things, but this exhibition shows a lot of those. Angles and I'm yeah. curious what you know. Do you have a preference and why? I just I, I guess I respond to the idea that you can kind of do whatever you like. So you can have a period of, of these hard angles. You can have these really, you know, all the all the all the curves and everything um, that are so sculptural. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, I think I think maybe the stuff with the lines is sometimes a little more striking mm -hmm. because it's so matter of fact. But the um, I I would say that I'm a fan of all of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is uh, not Ward Nesher. This is a this on, uh, a Noguchi chair in a museum in New York. I just thought this was kind of a great little image as it's rests uh, with its back against the wall. You had you if you would go to the next slide. I'm just saying that because you you kind of breeze past like I just make my own font. That's 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 kind of big. Like to 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 create your own lettering. That you know making fonts is a huge industry and there's lots of science to it. But like you created a very cohesive, pleasing you know lettering system there. That's that's nothing to sneeze at. I'm, I'm curious. Is like are you always Doodling, I'm always doodling. I see it from what I can tell from notes here. There's there's doodling there too, or just thinking in text and, and in that font. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I think it's just something I did. Um, I started doing anyway, um, where I would write like little notes on cards, mm -hmm. and yeah, I, I I think it's just part of the the process where it's like, um, you know, it's not like I, I guess some people are creative by their they're an artist where they paint, and that's their medium. I tend to look at it in terms of almost everything, like where, how I arrange something on the page as I'm writing down. Like for me, I, I, I want it all to kind of be pleasing to look at. So I, I think, yeah, that's just how I respond to it. But um, this is another room we created uh, in the at the pizzeria. This is a private. Uh, dining room um, called the Hoagie Room. Um, we this is um, what is this? Douglas fir. That's what that is, which is kind of like a, a nice, like light Japanese wood. Um, it looked a bit softer than the than the oak tables, but um, we were also able to use a a, a local artist who did. Um, the plaster walls here, where I saw this in, in Japan, but they would put uh, sometimes put uh, like uh, straw and sand sometimes in the plaster, 
So it's kind of it reflects there. And a little texture too? Yeah, oh. a little texture. Um, so this is another um, room in the pizzeria that I kind of put together. Could you talk about the movie? Uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I I guess, so this is the genre here. I, I had a, a small pizzeria from 2013 to 2018. Um, it was about a 350 square foot room in the Fishtown neighborhood. And when, after the five year lease was up, um, I decided to work with partners and create a more of a proper restaurant, I guess, with a bar. And I wanted to, I wanted to continue to work with John. And he wasn't necessarily a, he wasn't a cook, you know, and he also wasn't a restaurant manager person. So I basically created this room for him um, to serve people. Um, and we had a little bit of space in the back that was going to be a employee bathroom in like an AV closet. And I told my partners that I had another idea for their space. Um, and um, it's worked out really well. Um, but yeah. Would you explain, for those who don't know, what the whole like? It, it's kind of like, um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess, um, you know, we have 120 seats in the, in the restaurant. And um, so, the original, the original pizzeria was very, uh, very personal. And I feel like I wanted to have an aspect of that in the new place. So, you know, we're, we serve six people at a time. Um, we do two servings a night and it's basically the taste of the entire menu. But we also bake bread just for the room where we make three different hoagies, I guess, for that. So, um, we have, it also has its own wine list, um, those magnums. Or above, above John. Um, so it's fun. That's a very, that's a very curated experience. Yeah. I know that's a that's a controversial thing to use the term curated in other terms. I think it's fine, but <laughs> it's okay for you to say. <laughs> um, let's see what else do we have over here. Uh, this is just a couple pictures of my phone and uh, and the pizza cam book. Um, here is a picture, not a, uh, an interesting picture, of the Warden sculpture nocturne. Um, there's a Becky Suss painting over there, and then this is uh, oh, shoot, I forget. What's the name? I'll come back to it. <laughs> but that gives us an idea of how you did it. Yeah. It's part of your life it's every, every day. Is that kitchen or living room? That's a living room, yeah. So uh, I'm kind of um, also have a small collection of wine. So I, I work with the, the lettering and do other things. I, I created a line of like t shirts um, and grossest to walks. Is, I'm, I'm a big fan of Riesling. So this is means basic grand cru. For the for the you know best vineyards, um, just another kind of thing. Blanc de Blanc is a um, another wine shirt. It uh, speaks to uh, Champagne, where they only use Chardonnay, so it's the white of whites. Um, pizza. It's a little, little cloudy up there. This is a slices of tomato pie, which is kind of a, a um, local uh, Italian bakery uh, thing that you don't really see everywhere. Um, I would love to. So I, I moved here from Minnesota. I grew up in Virginia. I've lived in North Carolina. I've never heard of tomato pie before coming here. So I would love to learn what, what it means to you and what... Like what's important about tomato pie? Um, I think it's just it's. I mean, for me, it's always like the, the dough has to be excellent, and then um, nice long fermentation, and then um, basically you bake 
this tomato sauce, the thick tomato sauce onto it. And it's something that you would eat like at room temperature. So I'm hearing simplicity of ingredients that has to be in just the right like ratio. Yeah, yeah. So that it tastes really good. Nice. Um, and if I if I may, I feel like that leads to more metrics aesthetic too with those ratios being very keenly balanced. You know, there's simplicity but complexity. Yeah, I think balance is, is a really important word with a lot of it in that um yeah, it, everything has its has its place, and it's uh, it allows certain things to shine when it's all kind of in tune. Another couple pictures of tomato pie. I'm gonna get the metric in a second. <laughs> Well, the, uh, that was my uncle's cabin. Just another place um, of inspiration for me. Uh, it's actually where I wrote um, a good deal of uh, the, the cookbook pizza camp. Or uh, this is the Italian hoagie in the hoagie room. And then back to um, my first extra per purchase which um, it was a wall rack um, with two bowls and a fork and a spoon. Um, this came from a family in the main line in Philadelphia. And I think they collected um, a good deal of um, Eshrick's work and put it together over time. So they you know, didn't buy the pieces all, all at once. Um, uh, the footed bowl uh, to, I guess, your left is um, is really one of my favorite pieces. Um, created in 1946, um, it's just a sculptural, um, and apparently it was uh, he brought it to the World's Fair, but I haven't been able to get any uh, confirmation on that. Um, it's like the four feet there, and then you can kind of see the, the signature, which this, his signatures are amazing. I always like to look at just the W-E and then the, the date. Um, this is the other kind of a wide oval shape, um, kind of flatter bowl. Um, this one's cherry wood. And do you use these or are they just? No, I guess I would. I, I, I do like the idea of using things, but I just, yeah. It's tricky. It's a balance, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're made to be used, but also they're valuable pieces of art. And, yeah. This is the uh, signature on the, the cherry bowl. Nice. The fork and the spoon, rather. And then this is this really, really beautiful piece that, that kind of hangs, hangs, you know, um, the rack in the back. And then else do I have? Got the chest of drawers. Oh, yeah, this is the, um, would have been great in the show, I guess. This is a, a piece that Warden created for Marjorie Content. Um, and, uh, I guess it's called an exceptional cabinet. Uh, figured oak uh, has a great signature. Um, I, it, it's, it's really beautiful. Uh, they have this um, the dovetail here to me is, is really amazing because it starts on one end kind of uh, smaller and it grows as it, as it goes back towards the end, which um, maybe. Um, Mark can tell us how, <laughs> how difficult that is, but it seems it seems pretty pretty uh, insane to me. Mark's a very procurator when you mentioned that school book. Uh it's not. <laughs> uh, would you also maybe go back to the picture of the cabin? Because this idea of you know, we're talking about material and nature and your uncle and like how you got into Eshrick in the first place. Yeah. I mean, so I've been coming here, I guess, so this was built, I think, in 1977, 
and I have been probably going there since then. So, um, yeah, it's like a, an important place for me um, to be able to get away to. And, um, yeah, I think it's like, I think, you know, as a creative person, everyone needs needs the time to um, get away and, and, and kind of clear your head and just think of new ideas. This is a tote bag I did. I sleep pizza and I eat pizza, but I never drink. I'm not really sure what that means. I just like the way it sounds. This is another odd picture of uh, the Nocturne sculpture. Um, I think I, I'm not sure, but it was at a, a it was at an auction in in New York, and it didn't sell. And then it came back to um, Freeman's in Philadelphia, and nobody wanted it. I don't think so. I, I feel very fortunate to have gotten it. Um, it's uh, yeah, really dark piece. Um, it's American chestnut covered in uh, creosote, which I guess would you put on railroad ties or something. Um, like a like a tar it has a faint smell of tar, um, and I think uh, you know um, Warden created it for his uh, wife Letty. Uh, she lost a child um, in childbirth, and, and there's there's like a piece missing from it. Um, I think where the child needs to be. So it's really kind of a, a striking piece, but it's, you know, obviously really dark. It's, um, and he put it outside uh, to weather it. And I think that's where the crack came from, which is, uh, I think, also the reason that nobody wanted it. But I thought it was amazing. Um, yeah. What's your that's uh, 1927. Yeah. About creativity. I mean, you were talking about getting away and everybody needing time to get away and clear your head. Aside from the cabin, like, where do you find most of your creative inspiration, or when do you feel most creative? If you can pinpoint such a thing. Um, I think. So I've been uh, practicing meditation for about 10 years. And I think that most of, most of the good ideas or, you, yeah, um, have come through like moments of quiet. Uh, so I think that's really important um, because it's the stuff for me that's been, that's lasted um, where if you're, constantly racing and you know it's you're thinking about so many different things it's almost when you become still and you bring it back that you're able to things just kind of come out of wherever they come from thin air really i mean i, I couldn't tell you where but um um yeah i think that's uh that's an important thing yeah there's also that the escher quote um if it's not fun while i do it and I think that's an important thing too, um, just to kind of put that in perspective to your life and um, yeah, how, how you create things and um, what you do with your time. Um, it's not always the easiest thing to do, um, but I think it's important to, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, Esherick's, um work is so playful. And I think, um, you know, just being, uh, having that idea of being fun is so kind of childlike. Um, so that's another kind of principle I think is worth sticking to. Yeah. yeah. I think that's something to worth holding on to. I am wearing Snoopy earrings because I love Snoopy. 
I am a middle-aged woman, but I, I will wear my, I just, when I got dressed this morning, I was like, I want to wear something that makes me happy. And it's like, yeah, I think, you know, you were saying before about, you know, wanting it all to be pleasing to look at, all to be enjoyable, to have a sense of joy or a sense of fun, because the world is a hard place, so let's bring, let's bring some pleasantness into yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What else are folks out here thinking, either online or Well, for Costco, I like it took me a lifetime to, to uh, act like a child. Something. Yeah, the, somebody was mentioning that the, the Costco quote that we're paraphrasing, you know, took me a lifetime to learn how to be like a child. Yeah, sorry about yeah. that. Yeah. I'm, I don't think I have it either. <laughs> There's following and depression first. And our participants online are wondering if it's available, if we're able to share the slides with them after. It's a little blown out on our screen. Okay, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. Um, and I don't know if we ever talked about how you did get into pizza. Has any of that brewery in your background that's really near your background too? Or? Yeah, I started out, um, I guess, in my early 20s uh, working in in beer uh, brewing professionally. Um, and I did it for about seven or eight years. Um, and I got into pizza as a hobby, you know, you know, from, I guess it was just like a thing I would do on the side. And um, I, yeah, I just, I just got into it. You know, like when you realize that something's of a certain quality, but then there's a million of these places and why is one, great and the rest of them not so good um so i used to you know travel up to new york and go to all the old school places and i was on a trip to um i got a, a, a like a job in japan working at a brewery and the pizza there's i mean the japanese are just um amazing technicians and artists and there was some really inspiring pizzerias there where, I mean, better than Italy, it's like insane how, how good it is. Um, but they, I was able to, you know, sort of like my friend Michael was saying, he saw Wharton and it, um, it gave him the permission to kind of be a, this maverick wood woodworker. And I felt the same energy there where I looked at something that I thought seemed impossible, you know, in terms of opening a restaurant and doing this thing where at the end of the day, I just wanted to make the, the pizza, I guess, um, because that was the most enjoyable part of the process. Um, and when I was in Japan, I would see these places that were like eight seats and it was just one person, you know, making pizza. So I was really, um, influenced by that in the same way where I I didn't think it was possible until I saw somebody else doing something like it. Yeah, yeah. Well and I think that that kind of one to one that very customized or like this is for you, this individual, again I'm gonna I'm gonna make all the connections I can of you know the exhibition is about a lot of it is more make more measure making things for specific people or families. And so I think that that knowing who you're making something for and having them right in front of you, my guess is that creates a, a certain kind of intimacy that that changes the dynamic of what you're making. But I might be projecting. No, I think so. I think that's important. <laughs> I mean, as 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 the world kind of keeps moving forward, I mean, some of the most important, some of the best things are made with care, and how much of that. I like how important is that now and like so I mean it just seems like a lot in, with any business or any art or whatever um, when something is like handled and cared for you know there's definitely a, a, a cost and a price to it but the value is so great and I think it's that's like a really important thing um, with with hospitality but with with everything else, just the uh, the general yeah yeah care of it. Yeah. Oh, one thing that 
I've also been interested in with the exhibition and I'm gonna call on Mark to help me out, remind me of the woodworker who helped Eschrick actually engineer a lot of his things. John Schmidt. So oh, yeah. wanting to, you know, we're, the exhibition helps give credit to women who have influence on Eschrick's work, um, but also John Schmidt. This, this, a lot of these things wouldn't have been possible without this like very skilled woodworker figuring out how to make it work. And so those collaborations that sometimes uh, get hidden, you know, have, as we approach things, you know, years later, I'm curious about any collaboration that you have with that experience of working with other people, especially when you go from, you know, a very small restaurant to a bigger space and, and having to trust other people with your vision and ideas to, to combine them. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think you just have to find the right people that care about the quality and the hospitality aspect of it, um, where that is always going to be the most important thing. Um, so I, I feel like I was able to find those people and feel very fortunate for that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a um, this is just another kind of funny thing that I did. Um, I, I went. I have some friends that make wine in uh, Oregon. A friend of mine and his wife moved out there um, to the Willamette uh, River Valley and made wine. And I went out um, to work with him for for a week. And I worked with another winemaker in California. But when I was there, I was able to buy some grapes. Um, and kind of make my own wine. Um, so we, we continue to do this. This was in 2017. Um, and I just kind of a funny, funny label. Also influenced by a Lancaster woodworker who Henry Lapp, he had a, um, I guess he was, I don't know, what, what, how, do you, how do you say it now? I guess he couldn't speak. You know, deaf and mute. Um, and so I guess he, he was an artist too. So I'm, I'm from Lancaster County, but um, he was another, you know, artist who was Amish and I guess technically you would probably weren't able to be, be an artist. And because of his, you know, um, disability or whatever, um, he was able to create. Um, he, you know, he made ladders and um, I don't know what else. What else? Yeah, he had a chest and he, he pretty much made anything that was you could make out of wood. And he had a catalog that's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, so I, I kind of uh, based this ladder off one of his drawings. It's kind of crude, but. I'm curious how you pick the, the, the snake image. Is there something about that? I and mean, like, I see that kind of board. I, it fits so nicely in there. I think it's just to me, it's um, it's an efficient use of space, um, which I like. Uh, that's something um, that I respond to. And just the this, this sink is also made out of copper and it's really beautiful. And then it's a little like kind of soap dish right here. But, um, just where it's the idea where, you know, it's almost like everything's important and everything kind of fits together um, in this um, kind of like nice package. Mm -hmm. And you were talking, I think, before about like everything's in its place. Like, it's very yeah. good, like it's, it's right where it should be. And it looks probably pretty, I don't know, to use a big of ergonomic, right? Like it's right where you need it to be. Right. Um, and I'm guessing that that's, you know, my very limited cooking knowledge of mise en place and making sure you've got things where they need to be so you can be efficient in the kitchen um, is, is a connection that I'm seeing there too. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the form follows the function. Of, it's also beautiful to look at. I mean, I think just the, yeah, the amount of thought that gets into something that's amazing. I wonder if folks wondering, Yeah. 
Okay. I'm gonna repeat this so that folks are so so Mark Spurry is sharing with us that the that Escher signature was a brand that he made in the early 50s. So he made it in the 50s and he used it a little bit, but not much because he didn't really like it as fully as other things. So, I mean, too mechanical. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Quicker, but, but not as that. Do you think he signed it in 1927? And then... Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. I, I don't think I've, I, I've never seen it before. Yeah. So something to be looking for when you're looking at Asher's work is, is it branded or is it carved with the signature? Well, I know in the, um, in the, in the cabinet, which is all the way at the end here, sorry, um, there's a signature that's like written out just says Wharton Eshrick um, in this cabinet on the lower right that you can't see. It's on the inside, but it's just a, um, yeah, bring it with screen. You were talking about the book there in this piece. You know, there were uh, uh, a lot of, it didn't, it didn't have to have Right. But that's where Eshrick comes from. But it's, it's a very decorative expression. Yeah. So Mark's saying that the that kind of joinery wasn't necessary, but probably something that that wanted as a design element. Well, wasn't that that may be that may be that okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it starts out. So it's kind of, it, it changes in, in width too. So it's it gets thicker as it goes back. Yeah, yeah. Wider. Okay. I saw it again. I'm just curious, you touched upon it a little bit, but I'm very intrigued by this, um, as I'm aware of it, this process that you said you commissioned, or it would be commissioned. And Oh, so the question is about commissions and whether uh, Escher being commissioned for things would have been different than other workers like Nagashima. I unfortunately do not know about that, but there is much more information in the exhibition and in the catalog. <laughs> Um, I know that again, there was in the exhibition, you can see communication between Asher and, and especially um, uh, Arthur Content to, you know, back and forth of like these are the measurements and we tried it out. And, and I think this works, but maybe once we see it in place, it'll be different. And I think using maquettes possibly as well. So, um, you know, and then thinking about making furniture by hand. Um, you know, with uh, the names are not coming. <laughs> York and um, the 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 barn table, the table, the work. Sorry, the the work table with the Fishers. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so so Hannah Fisher and 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 York and sorry Helene Fisher and and making these. Uh, these things physically, you know, outside. So I think that there's that was a very specific example of uh, a single project, you know. But I think that there's there's a lot more. Please. Do you really have to be a 
So, so Mark's saying that often uh, families of people would commission a piece from Esherick and then it would, so it would be one, but then they would come back later and, and commission more and so they would grow their collection and probably grow that relationship too. And then he didn't, he didn't necessarily do a lot of production pieces except for maybe some stools and maybe that hammer handle chair also would have been a bit of that. Right. Didn't have a catalog. Anything? I just want to say another note. The pizza looks fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I should make a beer. I don't know. I'm going to go home. He's pizza. Are they making us all very hungry? <laughs> yeah, they, um, and I mean, the best, you know, most of the places that I went to only did two different types. They would do like regular marinara pizza with, pizza with just sauce and olive oil, gar uh, garlic, and oregano. And the other pizza would be with mozzarella cheese, margarita, and that was it. There was no other options or anything. I'm Very waiting good. for uh, extra dry beer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Kieran? Oh, yeah, it's supposed to be a certain style. Oh, I don't know about that. It's time to that extra dry. We have a, we have a delicious uh, a local pilsner that's very dry. That's del delicious um, on tap if you ever make it down there. Well, I think with that encouragement, I think if we haven't had dinner, it's time to get dinner. Or you can feed your soul. And go look at some, go look at the exhibition again. Um, and if you're joining us online, hope that you get to look at some of those images online. And I uh, hope that you come to the museum soon. Everybody would help me thank Joe for a great conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.